Good morning, everybody, and welcome. My congratulations to those who've made it to church this morning. It was indeed a torrential downpour and a cycle race to boot. But whilst doing so, may I just congratulate or thank perhaps those from I see Mississippi and North Carolina, any other Americans here, since the storm was their gift to us this morning. Bertha came from America, um, as most good things do. So thank you. And if you haven't detected the irony, I'll tell you about it afterwards. It's good to see joy back amongst us. We can worship with joy now that she's here, and uh, Jean David sitting on the front row there for his customary summer stint. I want to start with a downpour, in fact, with some words I remember hearing shortly after a downpour. Help is on its way. Five words in English. Two in French. Led arrive. But they were like water for my parched soul when I heard them. I frightened the life and drove the breath out of the poor man who uttered them. We'd been holed up in a very remote rural town in Haiti, isolated by a flood of biblical proportions. The waters had receded, but then began the process of assessing the damage and counting the cost. We counted over a hundred bodies. There must have been many, many more that we never reached or found. But we couldn't keep them or dispose of them. The ground was waterlogged, the graves were full of water. Food and drinking water were fast diminishing. Days passed. The one and only road connecting the town to civilization was hopelessly cut off, and the dictator under whose rule we lived refused to put his military helicopters at the disposal of a rescue effort. Our spirits sank very low. The people around us were in despair. And then, 
the messenger came. He was riding a motorbike, but he told us that the last obstacles were being removed and a convoy of vehicles with food and medicine and much else would soon be with us. I could have wept. I think I did weep. But I also charged the guardian angel to carry a message back for me to Margaret. She was eight months pregnant at the time and staying with friends who would certainly have been worried and fearful about my well-being. There were no mobile phones. No texts could be exchanged. He's fine. That was the message I wanted him to give. That was the message he gave. Two words. But what freight they carried. What a blessing they conveyed. That story, a remembrance of an event almost lost in my past, locked into it, contains all the essential ingredients that are at the heart of this morning's scripture. A whole people, says Paul, indeed all people then and now, here and there, are portrayed as lost, lonely, languishing in despair. And then, lo and behold, a messenger arrives. In biblical times, messengers, as likely as not, would have been on foot. There's a way out, he announces. All is not lost. Help is at hand. There's a new day dawning. The reference to beautiful feet comes out of that context. It goes back beyond the New Testament into the Old Testament into a prophecy given by Isaiah. His people were in exile. Their whole livelihood, culture, and national identity destroyed. The prophet took hold of their despair and shook the folds, the darksome folds, out of it. You'll be going back, he announced. The mountains will be flattened, the valleys raised. The twisting roads will be made straight. You thought you'd come on a one-way ticket? You didn't. Here is the return portion. It's all yours. How beautiful are the feet of one who brings good news. It's not difficult to apply that word to the motorcyclist who came to us all those years ago nor indeed to the helicopter pilot who brought supplies to those poor, poor Yazidi people in the northern mountains of Iraq over this last two or three days. How beautiful are the feet of the messenger who brings good news. Indeed, the possible applications of this idea are endless. But the scripture is more specific. It's the preacher of all people, the preacher whose feet are said to be particularly blessed. Why do I say of all people? Let me explain. Once upon a time, the preacher was a messenger. Not any old messenger, but someone who brought good news. Someone, in fact, with beautiful feet. But somewhere along the line, the preacher turned his pulpit into an ivory tower turned grace into law, began thumping his tub, laying down the law, placing himself and his message above contradiction. The good news of liberty and life turned into an oppressive message of morality, moralizing, morbidity, pettifogging, power, control. We all know what's meant when someone says, don't preach at me. If someone calls your literary style preachy, you may be sure it's not a compliment. My mother, my dear old mother's refusal to go to church, as I've said many times during my childhood, centered precisely on this alchemy, the turning of what ought to be beautiful feet with good messages, into ugly, clod-hopping, spirit-crushing, hope-dashing, bludgeoning, and bunion-encrusted plates that stepped on people's loves and delights 
and squashed them till they became sins and trespasses. My mother did her football pools regularly every week. She bought an occasional raffle ticket. She backed a horse each way and only in the big races. She smoked cigarettes, lodestone, they don't exist anymore. I must have bought hundreds for her. She liked a little tipple. She enjoyed, absolutely loved her bingo. She was divorced. By these things was the most wonderful woman in my world, considered by preachers to be a wicked sinner. No wonder she'd say, I'm not going to darken the doors of that chapel. I'm not going to give those preachers the chance to tell me how bad a woman I am. William Blake is our local guru, our local sage. His last remains are buried, if the doors were open, in eyeshot from me as I stand here. And he railed again and again in his poetry and his prose against the stultifying, sclerotic, petrifying, putrefying tendencies of organized religion. One of his words goes thus, if morality was Christianity, then Socrates would be our savior. And if the message of preachers can really be boiled down to moralizing, if holiness means nothing more or less than one's ability to tick the right boxes and abstain from lists of identifiable and preachable evils, Blake assents, we have a situation that's only too predictable. Just listen to these four lines of his poetry. The vision of Christ which thou dost see is my vision's greatest enemy. Both read the Bible day and night, but thou readst black and I read white. When morality is at the center of our religion, when our religion is turned to moralizing, then you have your opinion and I have mine. We may read the same Bible, but we'll pick different bits out of it to prove our case, and we've lost the plot. My plea is this. Preachers of the world, unite. Let's turn our back on preachy preaching. Let's give moralizing sermons short shrift. Let's go all out and treat ourselves to a pedicure. Let's get the hard skin off the soles of our feet so that we can scrape the self-hatred off the soles of our hearers. The pun was deliberate. Let's look for the response to our preaching that goes no further than that hallowed word, beautiful feet this morning, preacher. When anybody here says that, I'll know we're getting near what it ought all to be about. Let's set our sights on breaking the chains that imprison people, on helping to carry their burdens, on sharing their fears, on leading them out of self-loathing, on staying with them when they walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Let's bring a smile to people's faces. Let's put light back into their eyes. Let's put a spring into their step. Let's remind them that love conquers all that love that our God is, is, is defined by love whose only desire is to bring us into a life enhancing relationship with him come on preachers let's do it preaching is the only art I believe that can do all this in the Middle Ages it was called an art ours pridey candy I remember reading those documents in my earlier years, the art of preaching. Its objectives were threefold, to instruct, to persuade, to delight. Never to impose systems of thought, rules and regulations on people's backs, burdens they can't carry. But to encourage them, perhaps sometimes goad them, equip them certainly to see and understand that a believer doesn't have to go on a journey to find God 
or to pass his A-levels to understand God or to be better than others to please God. God can't be fetched or won or earned or tamed or found. Why not? Because, stupid me, he's been doing the fetching and the finding. He's been doing the seeking and the winning. My preaching always has that effect. <laughs> He's been doing the healing and reconciling all along. It isn't that we have to be strong enough to find God. It's more that we have to be aware enough to sense the presence of God already with us, at our side, on our side, all along. Then we can say, thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Spirit, for uplifting me. For God is in us always. And we twist the truth. If we turn that reality into one that sees us as separated from God and needing to do this and achieve that and conquer this and the other in order to stand a chance of discovering who God is. I grew up in Wales, and those Welsh preachers, they could preach. They could preach. I remember being in a congregation where the preacher was taken up by the Spirit and was describing at one moment an incident from the Old Testament where someone took a bow in order to fire it at his enemy. The way he described it, taking up that instrument, the way he saw, we saw the taut string being pulled back, and the way he described the release of that arrow, there were people in the line of vision who, who ducked when the arrow came over them. Oh, for preaching like that. So that once again we could, in a dramatic way if necessary, just remind people of how near that arrow of God is to them. But they are not separated from the love of God, but in Christ bound into the reality of the Godhead. But that spiritual dimension is a perpetual part of their very being. Awareness is what we need. George Whitfield is a wonderful preacher with a beautiful voice. He could bring tears to people's eyes, they said, by the way he pronounced the word Mesopotamia. Now, I have tried pronouncing that word in every conceivable way and haven't yet brought a tear to people's faces, but I have managed a giggle to their throats. But what I want as a preacher to do is to pronounce the good news in a way that has people responding with alacrity, opening themselves to a new understanding of who they are, who they belong to, what life is all about. I want that magic, that alchemy, that gift for me and all preachers to bring people alive out of their stupor, to give them a sense of hope in their despair, a sense of purpose in these bewildering times that we live in, a sense of gladness to be alive. Francis of Assisi instructed his followers to preach good news, but he added, only use words when they're necessary. So we must never think that the preachers are only people who stand in pulpits or who've followed the necessary course and can tick the box when they've got their certificate or are theologians formed in universities and seminaries around the world. For in this sense, we're all preachers. And in this sense, the way we are and the way we behave awakens in those we meet a sense of what life really means, what the deepest things are, what's beautiful and good, and wins people towards wanting those very qualities. So the preacher is me and people like me, but it's you and people like you too. For we preach the good news, not only with our lips, but with our lives. Then everything comes together. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. How beautiful 
are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. And I hope, without being too personal, that the feet of all the people I see in front of me this morning will bring a smile to people's faces as those around them recognize that they, you, are those who bring good news. God help us. Amen. My talents, gifts, and graces, Lord, into thy blessed hands receive, and let me live to preach thy word, and let me to thy glory live. My every sacred moment spend in publishing the sinner's friend. And now may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with each one of us, this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>